Hi, I'm Scott Scullion, one of the tutors in classics at Worcester College. There are four tutors in classics at the college. My own primary area of teaching and research is Greek language and literature. Dr. Peter Fowler works on and teaches Latin language and literature. Dr. Josephine Quinn uh, teaches ancient history, especially that of Rome and other peoples of the, of the ancient Mediterranean region. And Dr. Michael Paramatsis is a specialist in ancient Greek philosophy, especially that of Plato and Aristotle. We've all taught at Worcester for many years, but our backgrounds and training are various. I myself came to the college in 2003, ultimately from Toronto in Canada, where I grew up and was an undergraduate, and directly from the USA, where I did my, my graduate study at Harvard University. Dr. Quinn, the ancient historian, was an undergraduate at Oxford, but did her doctoral work at Berkeley in California. Dr. Paramatsis grew up in Greece and was an undergraduate at Athens before coming to Oxford for his doctorate and Dr. Fowler did both her undergraduate and graduate work here in Oxford. I'll say a little here about some of the commonest questions we're asked about our courses, but please don't hesitate to get in touch if you have further questions about anything to do with applying for or studying classics at Worcester College. To start with the most obvious question then, what does the study of classics involve? It's important to emphasize before I say a little about what's involved, that it isn't necessary to have done any previous study of any aspect of the ancient world in school in order to apply for the course. All that's necessary is a strong interest in the ancient world, and in the admissions process we're looking for people with a strong interest in and potential for the study of the ancient world independently of whether they've previously had any teaching in the subject. Our so-called Course 2 is specifically designed for those who've, who've not studied either Latin or Greek previously, and those admitted to course to undertake intensive study of either Greek or Latin in their first year. So classics is basically the study of the ancient Greek and Roman civilizations, and also their relationship with other ancient cultures. For example, the ancient Persians. There's a special focus on this in the first paper you would do as a first year undergraduate called Texts and Context, we study the relationship between Greeks and Persians in connection with the Persian Wars, how Persians are represented in Greek work and Greeks in Persian art and so on. Uh, we also study the relationship with the what we call the ancient Near East, so Sumerian, Hittite, Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Hebrew, and also with ancient Indian civilizations, the, the Sanskrit language and texts and, and others. Uh, classics can also be combined with, with other subjects in so-called joint schools, such as classics and oriental studies, where you can combine the study of classics with Arabic or Aramaic and Syrian, Armenian, Coptic, early Iranian, Egyptian, Hebrew, Pali, Sanskrit, or Turkish. And classics and modern languages, where the study of, of Greek and or Latin is combined with French, German, many other modern languages. <clears throat> There's also classics in English, self-explanatory. Um, so joint schools all involve so-called linked papers, which combine the study of the different languages and cultures involved, but a good deal of your study is also focused on uh, aspects of, the, of the, the different cultures and civilizations and languages you're, you're focused on, independently as it were. So classics is an inherently multidisciplinary subject because we study the languages, histories, art and archaeology, architecture, philosophies, religions, and many other aspects of the cultures that are studied in the various degree programs in classics. So, and Worcester tutors have a, a strong commitment to supporting comparative approaches to the study of the ancient world, which is one of the reasons we encourage and welcome applicants in all the joint schools that combine the subject with other ancient and modern languages and cultures. For example, our ancient historian, Dr. Joe Quinn, works on the interaction between cultures in the ancient Mediterranean world with a particular interest in ancient North Africa. One of my primary interests is ancient Greek religion in the comparative context of the religions and religious practices of neighboring cultures, especially those of the so-called ancient Near East. Another question we're commonly asked is, which area of your subject do you specialize in? Well, I work primarily on ancient Greek literature, especially tragic drama, ancient Greek and comparative religion, as I've just mentioned, and textual criticism, which is our term for how we try to trace our way back 
through the long tradition of ancient texts copied and recopied multiple times in handwriting, or in dealing with damaged copies of ancient texts inscribed on stone or written on papyrus, the ancient writing material, in the attempt to come as close as we can to the earliest versions of the texts. Another common question is, how is your subject usually taught at Worcester? Well, at Worcester we have tutors in all the main areas of the subject, languages and literatures, history, philosophy, ancient Greek religion, and comparative religions. So most of the students' teaching is done in college by college tutors. Most of our teaching is done in the format of tutorials, that is, one of us tutors meeting weekly with two or three students, but some is done in small classes. For example, the first teaching that Worcester first years have that I mentioned above is uh, the paper Texts and Context in a class of, of five or six. Uh, that paper combines the study of literature, art, architecture, and archaeology and history, and it's taught jointly by me and our ancient historian. You'd also have frequent language teaching, some of it organized centrally by the university classics faculty, and that would be alongside students from other colleges, uh, some of it based in, in the college and consisting of further work on the languages and on reading the various texts that you read in the ancient languages before your exams. There are also lectures which are organized centrally where students from all the colleges gather to hear an expert or experts in the faculty give a series of lectures on the subjects you're working on for your next set of examinations. You'll also be wondering how many contact hours a classic student at Worcester would normally have. So in the first four terms of the course, with some variation depending on the particular version of the course you're doing, you typically have one tutorial per week for which you'd write a weekly essay. You'd have between four and eight hours of language instruction uh, each week divided between faculty classes and classes in college, and you'd probably attend three or four lectures. These are all rough guides. In the case of tutorials and language classes, you'd of course spend several hours reading primarily ancient texts and secondarily scholarly writing about the text and doing language homework and exercises and writing your essay on the week's tutorial topic. Another common question is about what we what we look for in a competitive application for classics. And here the most important thing to emphasize is what I said earlier, that is that we're not looking for expertise but for potential. In the case both of those applicants who've done some study of the ancient world or ancient languages at school, and of those who've done little or none, were looking for the same thing. Enthusiasm for the subject that's led to some exploration of it. And it's the part of the exploration that's most independent of formal requirements or guidance that's generally the most interesting and indicative for us. That is, what applicants have explored on their own, out of their own interest and enthusiasm what aspects of the ancient world they've investigated for themselves, why those particular aspects intrigued them, and most importantly by far, how they've explored and read and thought about and processed them, what questions they've had about them, why and how they've formulated those questions and gone about attempting to discover answers to them, however partial or tentative the answers might be. It's from talking with applicants about that sort of thing and from getting a sense during the interview process of how applicants engage with discussion and debate about such questions and answers, that we get the best sense of their potential to thrive in a course of study which has discussion and debate in small groups as its basic mode of learning. And that leads to another important question. How important is each step in the application process? Well, we, we learn important things about applicants from all the components of the application process from their school record and teacher recommendations, their personal statements, the written work they submit, <clears throat> uh, and from how they do on the language tests or language aptitude tests that all applicants sit in their schools, as well as from the interviews. We take a holistic view of all of our individual applicants on the basis of all the information we have about them. The interview is an important component of the application process because it's the one part of the process that, as I've said, gives us the opportunity to interact with applicants in face-to-face -face mutual discussion <clears throat> that resembles how tutorial teaching works. But it's really important to add immediately that we know that varying levels of experience and, and of nerves mean that applicants are often very far from being at their most relaxed and natural during interviews, 
and that getting a holistic sense of an applicant means getting a nuanced, balanced sense of how all the different components of any application, including performance in two interviews, never just in one, add up in each individual case. We've often offered places to applicants whose clear strength in some components of the application process made up for comparative weakness in others. So if you come to interview, go through the process, just try to engage with each stage of it as best you can, as calmly as, as you can manage, and uh, don't worry that you know we'll be taking account of, of, of everything uh, that, we, that we can learn about you. A final question we're often asked is whether there are any particular resources or activities we'd suggest to prospective applicants who want to pursue their, their interest in classics. And the answer to this question follows on what I said earlier about potential being the key thing we're looking for in assessing, and how we're interested in the ways in which individual applicants have explored and thought about the ancient world. Precisely because it's individual applicants we're concerned with, we look for and welcome the hugely wide range of particular interests that applicants may have followed up. There's no core list of texts you should have read or things you should have thought about. We'd expect any applicant for the subject to have engaged in some independent exploration of it. But the range of possible things that might have intrigued you or other applicants is enormous. And what's important to us is not what particular things have intrigued you, but rather how you've thought about, questioned, and processed whatever intrigued you. It could be why the Greeks and some other ancient peoples had many gods rather than one, or, or the history of ancient coinage, or the evolution of the ancient languages and their relationship to one another, or ancient attitudes to gender or race or ethnicity, or ancient political philosophy, or comparative mythology, or particular ancient writers or genres of writing, or the techniques and aesthetics of ancient sculpture, or how the ancient world has been represented and misrepresented, how it's been used and abused in the modern world, or any of a thousand other aspects of the ancient world that can capture someone's enthusiastic attention. It's what drew you to whatever's intrigued you, and how you've thought about and processed whatever aspects you've followed up a bit that's of interest to us, not whether you've read this or that thing or know this or that fact about the ancient world. What you don't already know about and need to know about will point you to once you are on the course. But at the stage of admissions, it's interest and potential we're looking at. Well, I hope that gives you a good general sense about the course and the application process. But as I said earlier, please don't hesitate to get in touch if you have other questions, which we'd be very happy to answer. Good luck with your applications to universities, and I look forward to meeting those of you who choose to apply for classics or a joint school with classics at, at Worcester College. Thanks. Hello, my name's Dominic and I'm one of the Ancient History Tutors at Worcester College and I'm going to talk to you about studying Classical Archaeology and Ancient History at Worcester and at Oxford more generally. The first thing to say is that uh, there's lots of different ways of studying archaeology, classical archaeology and studying ancient history at the university. Um, so for example you can take the classics courses, they're also known as Literae Humaniores there's lots of opportunities there to study art, to study archaeology, and also to do, of course, lots and lots of ancient history if you want to. The Ancient and Modern History course, AMH, also combines uh, lots of opportunities to study the ancient world with uh, the study of modern history. Of course, that's in the name. But there are opportunities to do art and archaeology in that course as well. Classical archaeology and ancient history is dedicated to their study. So there's much more of a focus essentially on the history side and on the archaeology side um, to studying the ancient Mediterranean world. That then does mean that there are a few things that are special about CAR. Um, there's no literature component, so you won't do very much reading of plays and poems and philosophy. Uh, and you rather concentrate then on the history and the archaeology side. If you are interested in those things, uh, then maybe consider doing the Literae Humaniores, the classics courses, uh, because you do have lots of opportunities to study those things. And as I say, you can still do lots of archaeology uh, and ancient history too. Now for CAR, there's also no mandatory language learning, uh, so you don't have to do Latin and Greek essentially. You can choose to do this uh, as one of your options, um, but it's not prescribed, as for example it is when you do uh, 
classics uh, at the university. There is, however, a mandatory fieldwork component. Um, so you'll do that at the end of your first year. I'll come on to details of that in a moment. And you'll also write a thesis on an archaeological site or on a, uh, a collection in a museum as well. Um, and there are just basically more options available to you uh, to study different bits of archaeology. So you can do Egyptian archaeology is one, maritime archaeology, so the study of uh, underwater, uh, things that we find underwater are options for you as well. So what is the study of archaeology, classical archaeology and ancient history? Um, and what is it to study them in combination? Well, on the ancient history side, it's lots and lots in particular of texts that we have that have been passed down to us from the ancient world. Uh, these have survived in manuscripts that have been handed down generation to generation uh, and it's an extraordinary amount uh, of literature that we have from this period. It's one of the things that makes it quite special when we talk about the ancient Mediterranean is because we have people from that time talking to us through these texts. Now that's everything from poetry through to historical accounts uh, plays, poems, for example, uh, and then uh, uh, biographies of particular individuals, philosophical accounts, accounts of religious history and belief and faith and all the rest of it. So a huge, huge variety that we have from that. And then on the archaeological side, it's everything from pots, as you see here, this is a Greek vase, through to uh, astonishing architectural remains um, that have survived for us. And, uh, and so really what we're doing when we study these things together is think about how they relate. How can we ask questions? How can we uh, pose questions about society or historical events that we can think about not only from what we're told, uh, but also what we have found in the ground, essentially what's been passed on to us and the different things that they might reveal. So the study of classical archaeology and ancient history together uh, and one of the things that makes it quite special about studying this period as opposed to more modern periods of history is that we have to use lots of different types of evidence. So one of the most interesting things about it, and also one of the things that will develop skills in you if you take this subject, is learning how to compare an image with the text, is learning how to compare an object uh, with something that somebody has said. That's not an easy thing to do, but it's one of the things that we focus on the most uh, and that makes it quite special to study, uh, to study the world in this way, archaeologically and historically. So let's just have a think about what the teaching is like at Worcester. Um, you will be part of a group of uh, maybe five or six classes, but there's only usually one or two people studying car at the college at any one time. The others are taking a range of courses in the classic side, but they can also be doing classics in English and lots of different courses like this. Um, so you'll be kind of uh, on your own to an extent, but also part of a larger group. That then means that you're taught predominantly by myself. Uh, I'm the uh, uh, tutor in Roman history at Worcester at present, um, and also by uh, Professor Josephine Quinn who is the, uh, the main tutor in ancient history. Joe works on the Phoenicians, uh, uh, who are a group from the eastern part of the Mediterranean, and they move all over uh, the, uh, the ancient Mediterranean, the ancient world. And she's currently writing a book on the West and the relationship between what we call the West and the East over a huge period of time, about four or 5,000 years. Uh, myself, my own work is on particularly in religion, but I come from a background in, uh, in ancient history and classics and archaeology. So I'm one of these people who sort of brings lots of things together. Now, we're the main uh, focus of teaching at the college, but you'll be taught by lots of other people while you're here. And um, when you're at Worcester in particular, there's quite a number of other uh, people who do classics, in particular, Dr. Scott Scullion, uh, who's the fellow and tutor in classics. Uh, Scott's an expert on Greek tragedy uh, and also on Greek religion. He's always a friendly face around. And really he puts a, a kind of uh, a nice cover on what is a really good community of classicists, people studying the ancient world and classics at Worcester College. So as I say, uh, you'll be uh, one or two of you, maybe a year at Worcester, but that men makes up part of a larger group of about 20 students every year. Uh, across the university. And what you'll find is that your teaching is divided between things that you do in college, uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one tutorials in the main, uh, and then classes that are done as part of a larger group and organised by the Faculty of Classics. 
Um, and uh, that also then goes for lectures that you can go to. They're put on by the faculty and not by uh, the college individually. And they're on a whole range of topics that overlap with the courses that you choose to take. Now, in your first year, you will do two core papers, a Greek and a Roman paper that combine archaeology and history, just to give you a bit of a, a grounding in the ancient world. You'll then be able to choose two papers, uh, one historical, one archaeological, or you can pick up an ancient language. It doesn't matter if you've studied the language before, you can take that on uh, at an intermediate or advanced level. But if you're a complete beginner as well, you can pick up Latin and Greek uh, anew. You then take exams uh, at the end of your first year, they're called prelims. And in the summer vacation afterwards, you'll then do uh, an archeological dig. And so that will be at least two weeks uh, spent somewhere around um, usually uh, the, ancient, uh, the ancient world of this uh, Europe and the Mediterranean, North Africa to the Middle East. And we have lots of functioning digs going on from Spain uh, in Italy, bits of Sicily and in Greece, but you can also choose to do uh, a dig in the UK if you'd prefer. Then in your second and third years, it's a bit more flexible. You have uh, six papers to choose from a range of archaeological and historical options uh, or to continue um, studying the language classes as well. And you'll do a thesis, as I mentioned before, and that'll be uh, on a particular archaeological site or uh, a collection of objects in a museum. It's up to you really, and that's a chance for you to stretch your legs and uh, to do some research on topics that really interest you. Finally, you'll then do exams at the end of your third, uh, your third year finals, uh, and then the whole degree is over. Now, um, uh, making an application to the college, it's the same for everybody, uh, it's the same, uh, sets of things that you would do if you apply for any college at Oxford or uh, and there's lots of things that are just general um, that you obviously need to do such as your UCAS form filling in the personal statement your school reference and all of your qualifications GCSEs A-levels and things like that uh, we also ask for two pieces of submitted uh, written work and lots of details are available on that that you should check before applying and um, uh, after that stage of the application you may or may not be invited for an interview at Worcester and these will take place in December so there's a couple of interviews one's usually on archaeology the other one's on ancient history now we often get asked uh, any of these different elements more important than others and people tend to have a bit of a fixation on the interview process in particular the main thing is that we're uh, looking to see that you're interested and that this way of teaching a way the things that we offer really would be good for you and that they'd work for you uh, so of course the interview is important but actually it's no more important than the written work that you produce or the assessment, the personal statement and things like that that you make uh, too. So no need to get over-focused on any one of those. Now it's important for you to consider um, just whether or not ancient history is actually something that might be the right thing for you. So what I'd suggest you do is uh, go and have a look at the type of things that you'll be working with all the time if you were to study car at Oxford. So that's looking at ancient texts in particular and ancient documents, so things like inscriptions where you can find them or coins, stuff like that. Uh, but also having a look at the art and the archaeology. Um, you can find uh, quite easily uh, now because of the internet you can look up um, museums for example. The British Museum has an excellent range of images and information available um, on their objects and lots and lots of those are from the ancient world. So go and have a look, go and have a think about them. But the main thing I, I would do is uh, uh, write down some of the things that interest you. Big questions, small questions. Uh, how does the Roman Empire fall? Why was Greek democracy developed? Or something like, uh, how did you make a pot? How did you actually do that? Um, what is guttering in the ancient world? How do they get rid of water? How do they go to the toilet if you want? It's all of those sorts of things that can be, that can interest you. And then go and have a think about how you might find that information. Um, and there are lots and lots of things available online. Think then about how those people are making their arguments. What evidence are they using? And the best thing to do is to go and have a look at that evidence yourself whether it's the text, whether it's a coin, whether it's an object that they're arguing from, and see what you think. Ask yourself questions. Uh, do you believe them? Why have they made those comments? Uh, what do you want to know more about it? And what information are they relying on to make arguments? Lots and lots of different things. 
But essentially, that's what you'll be doing uh, if you do this course. So no need to wait, get on with it yourself and have a go. That's the main thing. So really, that's it. If, uh, if asking questions of the ancient world interests you, um, and if the array of different bits and bobs here on the screen uh, float your boat, then think about applying for car. The thing about studying the ancient world, it can often seem very, very distant. And of course it is. But whenever we study uh, bits, of pe uh, bits of history, bits of the past, we're always somewhat thinking about our present day circumstances. So you'll find if you have a look at the course handbooks uh, and the range of options that we offer, we are thinking about gender. We're thinking about equality and race. We're thinking about political movements, uh, about power, uh, and oppression uh, and how these things work. I mean, that's those are the big questions that we might ask and we might ask them today as much as anything else. And what the ancient world gives us is a way of exploring some of those things about ourselves as much as anything else. Um, and that's a chance to do it through some amazing objects, some amazing texts that have been left to us um, in this sort of space, if you like, of the past. So if that interests you, think about applying for car. But as I say, best thing to do is go and have a look yourself and see what you think.